the first half of the session. I'm really sorry for you because it was amazing. <laughs> um, and, but the good news is that if you missed the first half of the session, quite a lot of the things and the messages that were in the papers are repeated here. <laughs> um, so but one of the things that came back in the first half of the session was really the, the, a lot of messages about how uh, there is such striking gender inequality within archaeology. And so, like everyone, in, in each of the papers, there was a real call for doing something. And that's my general feeling. Let's, this is, let's stop chewing the fat and get on and do something. So, in this paper, I want to sort of talk about perhaps a way of doing something about it. And so this is a paper that's buoyed by naive optimism, I think. <laughs> uh, and you're welcome to tell me that at the end. Oops. Oh, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. I do know how to operate it, and it doesn't work. Oh, well. I will. So, um, as we, so this is a couple of familiar uh, uh, graphs that I'm going to show. So as we've seen um, uh, in the first half of the session, as we've seen in general, um, we, doing something has been going on. It's not like we haven't been doing something. And particularly, there has been a good, sustained feminist critique of the lack of gender equality in archaeology since the 1980s in, in the literature and uh, and that and in society in general so although there are and Sarah's uh, paper really flagged up those kind of uh, depressing uh, backward steps that society seems to be taking in terms of gender representation but still there has been some benefits and we can see that in the most recent profile in the profession the gender gap has narrowed hooray but um, there's still more men in archaeology than there are women in archaeology. And um, particularly, as was pointed out earlier on, there's more men in archaeology uh, and more, many more men in archaeology over the age of 40. And this uh, statistic really resonated uh, with uh, Sarah's slide where she had a quote from someone who said, women over 40 disappear. And this is a graph where they certainly do. So we know that these glass ceilings already exist. And in fact, um, this is something that hasn't been said already, but there's a series of other barriers that exist throughout the professional uh, uh, range. Sarah alluded to it earlier. Um, uh, oh, <coughs> but before I get to those, also. <laughs> um, I, I, so I'm going to go on and talk about gender, but I also want to talk about uh, other issues of equality and diversity, although I know this is a gender session, so I'll mainly touch on gender. But just to uh, emphasise to you, here's the profile in the profession statistics. So 98.2% of archaeologists are not disabled. And here's the one that shocks the life out of me. 99.2% of archaeologists are white. And these are shocking, particularly if you compare them to the national uh, census statistics. So the census statistics from 2000 and uh, from 2011, uh, so 82.1% of people did not have an activity limiting health problem or disability. So that's a 16% difference between the rest of the population and us as a profession. And then 86% of the UK population are white, so that's a 13% difference between us and the rest of the, the population. So we're, we're out of step quite considerably with the wider uh, British public. And um, so going back to what I was going to say, that um, there, are, there are clearly a series of, of barriers within archaeology. And those barriers exist uh, both at a higher, sort of uh, throughout your career progression, and in particularly the, the disappearing women over the age of 40. But those barriers also exist between students and the profession, for graduates as well. So um, a few years ago, I did a, a small study which I called Digging Diversity. And I uh, sent out a, an online questionnaire to, uh, to the world, and about 500 people responded. About half of them were students, and half of them were professionals. And there's no point showing the professional graph, because the professional gender identity was both female and male, and that was it. But what was really interesting was that there were students who named their, their gender identity in a whole series of other different ways. A series of them didn't want to state their gender identity, they didn't feel that was relevant. A number of them said that they were male, transsexual, transgender, queer, gender fluid and female transgender. 
And I think this flags up a point that's not yet been made today um, that reminds us that gender is not necessarily as binary as, as, as we often discuss. And yet, if gender is not necessarily this binary, well, mm, there's only men and women, uh, according to profile in the profession, and according to this very small study that I did, in the profession. So there's a, a barrier right there uh, that, that exists for students. And the same is true for ethnicity, and the same is true for disability. So this is a chart of all the disabilities that people gave in the Digging Diversity uh, um, study. And uh, you don't need to read them all. The thing you can take away from it is that in the column marked professional, there's much less than in the column marked students, and a much greater diversity of, of disabilities. So there clearly exists a series of barriers. And this is important because, as we know, archaeology has become a graduate industry. Most people under the age of 30 in archaeology have an archaeology degree. So there are a, a, a series of barriers there, not just glass ceilings as we progress and for women disappearing over the age of 40, but, uh, but even at the, the graduate level, there are some people because of discrimination who or, and the experience that they've had and the, the demands of the profession who won't make it through those barriers. So uh, we've seen in all the papers in the first half of the session and these few statistics show that these glass ceilings, these barriers exist. And yet uh, uh, um, an, an, an attitude that I've come up against several times is this, that equality and diversity issues are somehow a niche issue, a niche concern or a secondary issue. They're secondary to things. So in the last year, um, myself and my colleague, Karina Croucher, have given uh, about 10 papers about pedagogy. And we take a very holistic uh, approach to, to pedagogy in which diversity issues are central to us. So we've talked about this kind of thing. And um, it, this is a couple of responses that we received with, in relation to, to our paper. Uh, that archaeology needs to be a financially sustainable profession and only when we've resolved that can we address the less pressing issues like gender. Or we need to make sure jobs aren't being lost before we deal with diversity. This perception that, that this, is, this is secondary to everything. And yet from the papers that we heard in the first half of this session and from common sense we know that this is not the case. So when one company uh, undercuts another company by not having portaloos, that's a gender issue. When uh, someone raised earlier the possibility of, of units bidding for it, will to have a, a fridge on site to store breast milk for women who are expressing, that's going to make them more expensive. So there we go. Gender and finance are closely intertwined in that respect. Or if people have to go part time to uh, to be able to undertake childcare because the, their employer won't allow them to have flexible working, or if uh, your pregnant and you're laid off because uh, your, your company basically don't want to pay your maternity leave, which we've heard that anecdote already in this, this session. Um, all of those show that gender equality and diversity aren't a secondary issue. They're, they're in, entirely inherent and incumbent within finances, within, within us being a financially sustainable profession, within our job issues, within pay and conditions, as we heard earlier. And I think fundamentally, we know that these aren't a secondary issue, because look, they're in the flipping law look. <laughs> There's the Equality Act 2010. So the Equality Act uh, is um, mainly aimed at uh, public institutions, and it aims, uh, this, I've cut and pasted this from my website, so it's very small text, it aims to um, reduce socioeconomic inequalities. And it's a really important piece of legislation. And yet, as a, as a discipline, it's one that we never really look at that much. We, we really care about adhering to health and safety law, quite rightly so. But this is a piece of legislation that perhaps gets a lot less of a look in as a profession. So rather than it being a niche or a secondary concern, we know that gender inequality issues are really important. They're really fundamental to our everyday practice. And as a result, I think we need a strong profession-wide response to this. We need to do something. And who best to take a central role in this than our Chartered Institute of uh, Archaeologists? And so Joe talked briefly about what already exists 
out there, what CIFA already has. Uh, and so this is a, a, a summary again. So they have two things that already exist. And this is another comment actually that, I, that we got actually at, I, at the IFA conference last year, where someone said, it's already in the code of conduct. Do we, do we need anything more? <laughs> and so this is where it is in the code of conduct. There's, uh, there's the equal opportunities in archeology span policy statement, which is a one page, six point <coughs> policy statement, which um, as, as Joe pointed out earlier, is very broad and it basically just says we should be equal. And, that's it. and then there's the Code of Conduct Principle 5 is the one that's relevant here, which says that the member shall recognise the aspirations of employees, colleagues and helpers with regard to all matters relating to employment, including career development, health and safety, terms and conditions of employment and equality of opportunity. And that last thing is elaborated on in more detail in Rule 5.3. A member shall give due regard to the requirements of legislation relating to employment discrimination on grounds of race, sex, age, disability, sexual orientation, or religious belief. So that's that's where equality and diversity is 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 so far in our profession uh, on the books, effectively. And as as was pointed out earlier, that's great. But how many people read that? How many people act on it? How does that call on us to act in any kind of way? And so, I think, and I think we all agree, we need to do something. And I think the, a good way to do something would be to have a CIFA Equality and Diversity Special Interest Group. And I put here, we propose it, the main people proposing it are myself and Amanda Feather, who's the Head of Capacity Building uh, for Historic England, who's running another session right now, and that's why uh, she's not here. Um, and um, earlier on, I think Rachel mentioned feeling a little bit nervous about this kind of a thing, and a couple of people agreed. So I suppose in the rest of this paper, what I want to do is, is make the case for why I think this is necessary and what it could do, some of the things that it could possibly do. So I think an equality and diversity special interest group would be really well placed to help us to better understand um, equality and diversity. We've already seen that there's a bunch of studies, so there's the, the profile in the profession touches on this kind of thing, but as we've seen, there's problems with that because there's quite a limited response rate, so there's not necessarily a, a sort of accurate reflection within that. There's very small studies like my Dick and Diversity study, there's the British Women Archaeologists' work, and again, these are sort of small numbers. So we need to, we need to get on and understand this at a broader level, to research this more broadly. Um, and also, not just to research kind of the profile of our, of our discipline in terms of equality and diversity, but also to research what those barriers are, to get, uh, and I think we've heard quite a lot of, of what those barriers are today, but to get sort of the, the empirical evidence to support our case. And I think the most important thing about this is that this needs to be a continuous process because these things change over time. They change as the economy changes, they change as the jobs market changes, they change as the legislation and the heritage bodies that, uh, that we work with change. So this needs to be continually assessed uh, in, in the style of something like the profile of the profession on a regular basis. And then I think an equality and diversity special interest group could really help the profession to uphold standards in equality and diversity. More than just the, the lip service that's in the, the code of conduct and the equal opportunities policy. Um, it could help us, uh, uh, it could help the uh, profession understand and implement the Equality Act and the implications of that piece of important piece of legislation. Um, it could, and, and I think probably a very pro productive way would be to create a standard and guidance for equality and diversity. Wouldn't that be good that we can have something that lays down those standards and guidance for achieving them for equality and diversity? And um, something that obviously was launched in this morning's Future of Archaeology session is um, uh, Kate and Ratcher's Thelma and Louise road trip um, uh, to, uh, to launch the, to the consultation process for individual chartership. Well, individual chartership is going to have how one achieves that if that is something that comes to pass will have ramifications in terms of equality and diversity so a special interest group can play an active role in that kind of consultation i think that'd be really important and then i think probably one of the most major things that an equality and diversity group could do is share and promote best practice so we've already heard from the british women archaeologists today that there's a, a repository there of really great stuff about 
about uh, gender discrimination. There's other excellent organisations as well. There's the Diversity and Heritage Group, who deal with a sort of broader, more museums-based group. And then there's things like the uh, English Heritage Social and Inclusion, Social Inclusion and Diversity Team, whose name has probably changed. Uh, <laughs> maybe they're just the Historic England Social and Inclusion and Diversity Team, but I've not found that out, I'm afraid. Um, so, uh, so there's those various organisations and others. And I think what would be, what is really important uh, about a potential equality and diversity special interest group is not that it treads on other people's toes, but it does what other people have done, but that it works in partnership to bring together resources, to have some kind of a hub or something like that that has an online repository links to all those kind of things so that people who want to implement best practice in equality and diversity in their work practice and for their employees and for themselves can find all that information at, the, at the, their fingertips. That would be a brilliant thing to bring together. And also, uh, um, I, I had to sort of hold myself back from saying it earlier on, but I, I think we should have uh, an everyday sexism in archaeology. Mm -hmm. uh, I think to, to, to bring to light the, in, the endemic nature of sexism in archaeology, I think that would be a really useful thing to do. So, you know, let's basically get fourth wave feminist on this. Let's go to social media man with it. And I think that would be really, really useful. And then finally, and perhaps most productively, I think that we should um, find a way to make people want to aspire to equality and diversity. Because at the moment, as we said, everything, even if we produce a standard and guidance, what, what stops that from just being lip service? We need to make people want to aspire to this. And so personally, and I'm happy to, to discuss how we might do this, but I've been really um, inspired and influenced by the Athena Swan scheme and the Equality uh, Charter Mark scheme that's run by the um, Equality Challenge Unit. Uh, and this is an academic scheme. So uh, the Athena Swan scheme works like this. Academic departments can, and it's a science uh, a scheme, Athena Swan. So scientific academic departments basically can uh, apply for an award of bronze, silver or gold to, and that will reflect how much they support gender equality, how much they support their female colleagues getting back into work after maternity leave, how they support flexible working, all of those kinds of things. Uh, and it's really rigorous. Hardly anyone gets gold. And it's become something that that scientific academic departments really seriously aspire to. They really want to get this. Well, how about something like that, that's really proactive, that makes people want it, and they can put it on their website, so it makes them look good, and gosh, they can apply to be on the Stonewall list of great employers if they do this kind of stuff too. And so that would be something that, express, that uh, an equality and diversity special interest group, I think, could make a real difference by doing. And finally, I think if we help to increase the understanding of the role of archaeologists uh, in society amongst diverse groups of people, then more diverse groups of people will want to do archaeology. And then we can help challenge those uh, inequalities by getting, getting a more diverse bunch of archaeologists in. So, I really just want to conclude, therefore, by saying I've, I've made my case, and uh, this is just sort of well, this is ideas that have come about through consultation with people like the British Women Archaeologists, the English Heritage uh, Social Inclusion and Diversity Team, people like that. Um, but I know that other people will have ideas, and already some things came out earlier on about things that we could do. So this is a, a discursive process uh, that, that uh, hopefully could produce something really great. So we need your thoughts about what this kind of a group could do. But the other thing, the most crucial, the most pressing thing, is we also need you as well. Because at the moment, there's myself and Amanda Feather, uh, who are uh, proposed uh, uh, corporate members for the committee. Uh, we need at least six more people for the committee, uh, one of whom needs to volunteer to be a treasurer. <laughs> and then uh, we also need 15 corporate members who are willing to sign up to the group just as nominal members as well. And so you will have noticed that I've littered the room with small flyers. And there's also a pile of them here if you want to take them away and litter the world with them. Um, and these have got, uh, you can fill out your contact details, or you could email me, or you could tweet me. 
uh, if you're interested and you want to be down on the list. All we need for that list uh, of uh, members uh, who are willing to sign up to that is your name and your email address and your IFA number, I think, which I could find from the, uh, from the book, if you don't know it, from the IFA yearbook, or from supportive colleagues within the IFA, it's the IFA. So, I'll finish there, but I hope that that has helped convince you that this could be a useful and productive way of doing something about all the awful stuff we heard in the first half of the session. Thank you.